Brothers and sisters, aloha. aloha. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to introduce your devotional speaker today. Jerome Uluavi is like a son to me and someone who I have come to admire and respect. Jerome was the first of six children born in Kahuku to Sioni and Simaima Uluavi. At an early age, it was evident he was an unusual child and the Lord was preparing him for greater things. Twice he almost died and was saved by a loving mother who heeded promptings and came to his aid in time. At the age of four, he was taken to the Mantai Temple pageant. There he told his mother, this is where I will marry one day, a promise that was indeed fulfilled. Jerome loved the outdoors. He enjoyed swimming and camping. While in high school, he also loved to play football. Because his mother was now supporting the children on her own, he dropped out of the team so he could work on Saturdays to financially help her. He knew he needed to take the place of his father and look after his mother and siblings. This is when he learned the value of honest toil by planting banana trees and even worked for Bud Bailey Construction to help build the Wailua Chapel. When he was 14 years old, he and a friend received an award for bravery from the governor of Hawaii for rescuing a mother and child from a burning car. Jerome's life had truly been preserved for greater things. During his teenage years is when my family came to first know Jerome. A seminary student in my late wife's class, he became known as one of the mixed nuts, a small group of boys who, well, shall we say were more challenging to teach than the rest. My Maori wife had been a registered psychopedic nurse in New Zealand, so she didn't give up easily on difficult children. Try as she did to reach out and love these boys, Jerome, one day at our home, preparing for a scripture bowl, turned to his cousin and said, I'm done being good. Jerome gave me permission to recount what happened next. That evening, there was a party at the Lightyear Point, so he decided to attend. His friends greeted him and handed him two bottles of beer. He took the bottles, looked around, and said a silent prayer. Heavenly Father, if you love me, show me. As soon as he finished his prayer, there was a commotion in the crowd. A van driven by me had made its way right into the middle of the crowd and sat right on top was my wife yelling, Jerome, you little rubbish, where are you? <laughs> that became the turning point in his life. He then knew he really did have a father in heaven who loved him. Jerome went on to graduate school from seminary, to graduate from seminary and high school. Around this time, he heard President Spencer W. Kimball speak on this campus and urged all young worthy men to serve a mission. This greatly inspired him and decided right then he wanted to go on a mission too. But he knew his first allegiance was to his mother. She needed his financial help, so a mission was out of the question. After some time passed, and with the urging on of his faithful, loving mother, who knew her son was like one of Helaman's stripling warriors, he submitted his papers and was called to serve in the California Santa Rosa mission. Two weeks after beginning his mission, his mother was given a full-time teaching job and now able to provide for herself and her children. His missionary service touched many lives. Some church members in his proselyting areas wrote letters of gratitude to his mother and even stayed at her home when visiting Hawaii because Jerome happened to be very generous with his invitations. A practice his poor, worn-out mother ended up asking him to stop. It can be very taxing when you've accommodated 100, over 100 visitors in two years. He even gave away his bike and suit on his mission to needy people, then turned around and asked his mother for replacements. 
Following his mission, Jerome served in the army and accumulated over 20 years of oversight on industrial, commercial, and residential projects in both public and private sectors. That, this was accomplished by forming and running his own construction company as project manager in other companies and as a business consultant. In 2010, his work ethic and accomplishments then caught the attention of BYU Hawaii, where he became the construction project manager and coordinated design, review, and construction of all commercial and residential projects. In 2014, he was appointed vice president over facilities maintenance at the Polynesian Culture Center. During all this time, he somehow managed to enroll in classes at BYU Hawaii, the University of Utah studying in architecture, Utah Valley State College studying construction management, where he received a bachelor's degree, and Western Governors University, where he is currently studying for an MBA degree. While in Provo, he met his eternal companion, Betty, and in 1995, they were married in the Mantai Temple, just as he planned. They now have eight beautiful children, two of whom are getting married in the temple this year. His return missionary son in March and his daughter in April. He has another son that is about to submit his papers for his mission call. Elder Marvin J. Aston once said, the Savior lived the quiet giving life. We should do good quietly, privately. Proper giving and sharing in God's sight will be rewarded openly. Quiet giving puts into action the admonition that we be doers of the word. The same could be said of Jerome. His quiet demeanor has engendered respect. His words are always profound. His work ethic and educational pursuits have earned him the right to be called a doer. His love of the Lord and his family is unquestioned. The lives he has touched for good are innumerable. We are truly blessed, brothers and sisters, this day to hear from him. Brothers and sisters, aloha. But with the introduction like that, the only thing left to say is I'd like to thank you for thank you all for coming to my funeral. <laughs> thank you, Deidre and uh, Janine and Molia and crew for the beautiful flowers and the setup. Your group always does an excellent job. I'm also grateful for Dia and Monique. They chased me all over creation just to get my photo for the flyer. And my kids teased me because they didn't think I had teeth until they saw that photo. <laughs> I'm also very glad that my wife and uh, children got to hear those nice words. Elder Seto, during that eulogy, my life literally flashed before my eyes. <laughs> Everything I've ever done or become summarized in two glorious minutes. Isn't that interesting? I actually hope that there would be enough doing in there to last at least another 28 minutes. As you were going along the track of my life, Elder said, I was beginning to think that I was really something special. But then it all ended so abruptly. In a talk to uh, BYU students in 1984, President Nelson said, quote, track stars don't begin a race without knowing the location of the finish line. So, in your important race, I would plead for you to begin with the end in mind. To assist you in defining that end, I would ask you this simple question. What would you like said about you at your funeral? Or if you were to write your own eulogy and you could have only three sentences, no big flowery, flowery speeches, please, what would you want to say? 
prophet goes on to say, if it's fair for me to ask that of you, it's fair for you to ask that of me. He says, if I were to write what I hope might be said about me, those three sentences would include, I was able to render service of worth to my fellow men. I had a fine family. I evidenced unshakable faith in God and lived accordingly. Think on that for a second. In a nutshell, these are the three things that our prophet hopes that they say about him and his life. He served, he had a fine family, and that he lived his faith. President Nelson goes on to say, one of the most remarkable things about these three objectives is that they all have one requirement in common. That requirement is education. The educational process is crucial for success in each objective and is never ending, close quote. I'll repeat for emphasis. The educational process is crucial and never ending. What does your educational process look like? I took some time to think about my educational process and I'm glad that the Lord gives to the children of men, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little and there a little, because we all learn at our own pace. This is part of the Lord's plan. Let me illustrate with a few stories. When I was in elementary school, I made some lifelong friends, brothers, if you will, some of which are here today. And as is customary in many of our familial loving relationships, I will now proceed to throw them under the bus. <laughs> as it is with most relationships, there's a period of time where you're trying to figure each other out. This band of brothers was no different. At this particular stage in our childhood, I think we were just trying to figure out which house would be best to play at, which house had the best food, and which house gave us the best opportunity to do whatever we wanted. So we planned a day to play at my house after school. I don't remember what we did, but I know I had a good time. And when my mother called me to come in, I didn't want to listen. So I told her no. Have you ever told a Samoan mother no? <laughs> well, I'm about to explain what happens to you when you do. She looked around for something to reprimand me with. That's why I'm always looking behind my back. And finding nothing nearby, she picked up a rock. She raised her hand up behind her head and looked at me waiting for a response. So I gave her one. This is what it looked like. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And I said to her, go ahead. Like a quarterback, watching the tendency of a defensive back, she did a double pump, and I bit. She got me in the air before she let the rock go. It hit me square on the ankle, and I started howling. I looked around for my band of brothers for help, and they had disappeared. <laughs> would, it, would it have been easier for me to listen? At that stage of my educational process, I would have to say, nope. So the Lord sent me to the back of the line, upon line, upon line, upon line, until I learned. Did the consequences of my actions teach me anything? At that stage in, of my educational process, I would have to say, nope. So the Lord sent me to the back of the line, upon line, upon line, until I learned. Second, second experience. For my 17th birthday, ooh, and the parents are out there today, my band of brothers decided to take me out to dinner and a movie. The only problem was that we didn't have a vehicle. I know you students can relate to that. And repeated attempts to procure one ended with rejection after rejection. So we waited until one of our friend's parents went to bed. He's sitting somewhere over here on the left. And we put the car in neutral and we pushed it to the highway. We started it up and we were on our way. Happy birthday, Jerome. <laughs> this particular car we affectionately called the hula car because when you drove it, it swayed from side to side. 
However, the faster you went, the less way you felt. So we drove fast. On this particular night, we ran into a little problem and our evening in Waikiki was cut short. This was a good thing because church started at eight o'clock in the morning. So we drove home fast. We arrived at the house with a few hours to spare before church. We put the car in neutral and pushed it up the road into the garage. A few hours later, my friend's dad knocked on the bedroom door and let us know that it was time to get ready to go to church. We got dressed and piled into the car. We drove about 100 feet when the back of the car dropped to the right. We looked outside the back door window and the car tire rolled by and into the ditch. When we retrieved the tire, my friend's father said, wow, there was only one lug nut on the tire. Would it have been easier for us to listen to our parents and not take the car? At that stage in our educational lives, I would have to say, nope. So the Lord sent us to the back of the line, upon line, upon line, upon line until we learned. Did we understand the potential consequences of our choice to take the hula car? At this stage in our uh, educational lives, we were invincible. We thought about it, but nothing happened. So we weren't worried about it. Once again, the Lord sent us to the back of the proverbial line upon line, upon line, upon line, until we learned that he was preserving us. Bishop Keo, David Keo, was the bishop of my late teenage years. He came to our house one Saturday morning to see me. Mom let him in and he knocked on my bedroom door. He said, boy, this is Bishop. I opened the door and he motioned for me to come and sit at the dining room table. When I sat down, he said, you are going on a mission. This Sunday, you will start your paperwork. I will sustain you as a second counselor in the Young Men's Presidency and an assistant scout master to Larry Nihipali. You will also be the deacon's quorum advisor. Any questions? I said, nope. And so it was. And so I served in the ward and in the Santa Rosa, California mission, the best mission in the world. Uh, you dispute it, come meet me outside. <laughs> Would I have served the mission if Bishop Keo hadn't come to the house? At that stage in my educational life, maybe, maybe not. Did I understand what I was getting into by accepting those callings? At that stage in my educational life, no. But I learned quickly that I had to be an example to those 12-year-olds. And oddly enough, it kept me in line, upon line, upon line, until I learned. How long will it take us to learn that obedience is the first law of heaven? A cornerstone upon which all righteousness and progression rest. It consists in compliance with divine law, in conformity to the mind and will of deity, in complete subjection to God and his commands. Cecil B. DeMille, director of the epic biblical film, The Ten Commandments, told the student body at Brigham Young University, the other Brigham Young University, we are too inclined to think of law as something merely restrictive, something hemming us in. We sometimes think of law as the opposite of liberty, but that is a false conception. That is not the way that God's inspired prophets and lawgivers looked upon the law. Law has a twofold purpose. It is meant to govern. It is also meant to educate. And so it is with all the commandments. We must look beneath the literal, the surface meaning of the words. 
we must take the trouble to understand them. For how can we obey God's how can we obey commands when we do not that we do not understand? But the commandments too have an educative function, which you can see in the life of anyone who keeps them. They produce good character. The Ten Commandments are rules to obey as a personal favor to God. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you slide up? <laughs> the Ten Commandments are not rules to obey as a personal favor to God. They are the fundamental principles without which mankind could not live together. They make of those who keep them faithful, strong, wholesome, confident, dedicated men and women. This is so because the commandments come from the same divine hand that fashioned our human nature. God does not contradict himself. He did not create man and then as an afterthought impose upon him a set of arbitrary, irritating, restrictive rules. He made man free and then gave him the commandments to keep him free. The scriptures tell us to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of lambs. Father Lehi in the Book of Mormon reminds us that we are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. God has given us agency and in regard to that agency I ask and sometimes I ask myself, why do some of us have a tendency to choose the great mediator of all men, and why do some of us have a tendency to choose the devil? And further, are our problems generally that simple of a choice, light, darkness? Perhaps not, but in many cases we complicate the decisions and sometimes we don't even realize it. For example, if we engage in an act of self-gratification or indulgence, chances are that we've made many little decisions that pushed us to the big decision that put us over the edge. Then it becomes easier to go to that edge. Interestingly, the decision-making process is the same for acts of kindness, of love, of service. So what is the solution to helping us make the best life decisions? stay on the covenant path. Elder Holland said, when those moments come and issues surface, the resolution of which is not immediately forthcoming, hold fast to what you already know and stand strong until additional knowledge comes. The Lord tells us, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So why make a life-changing mistake and suffer? Christ told the prophet Joseph Smith, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. But if they would not repent, they must suffer even as I which suffering caused myself, even God, the greatest of all, to tremble because of pain and to bleed at every pore and to suffer both body and spirit. Now some of you may be wondering, what does this all have to do with the topic? I will go. The first and great commandment is to love God and the second is to love thy neighbor. If we love God, we listen to him, even when we don't want to. If Nephi didn't love his earthly father, he would not have said, I will go and do. Ruth would not have said to her mother-in-law, Naomi, entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And our Savior would not have said to the Father, Here I am, 
send me. A word of caution. Following the prophet, keeping the commandments, and listening to the spirit is not necessarily an easy road. It can be terribly taxing. But the underlying peace that comes from your love of the Father and your conscious decision to stay the course will bring peace in the journey. Come unto me, all, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In 2006, our family moved back to Hawaii. Well, we moved to Hawaii. Um, it was a painful move. We didn't want to come. Yeah, I'm sad to say I didn't want to come. But we did. The transition was difficult. I wanted to start a business, but was relegated to running projects for other people. I did well and moved up the ladder, but that's not what I wanted to do. A position opened up at BYU Hawaii in 2010, and my wife and I felt impressed to apply, and I was hired. In 2014, we were offered a job at the Polynesian Cultural Center and went there. In every instance, the Lord has guided our decision making, and I have been a happy grump. I have an incredible wife and wonderful family that I love very much. I have time to spend with them. I eat well, as you can plainly see. I have friends all around me. I have an incredible support network. I have spiritual experiences at work, at home, and in the community that strengthen my testimony of the Savior, of the priesthood, and of the plan of salvation. I associate with students like those who participated today. And some actually came with these, this event um, that you're having on campus and at the cultural center from abroad. So I associate with students of promise and I'm excited, very excited to see and hear of their success abroad. I have bosses that kneel in prayer with me. I have coworkers that celebrate and mourn with me. We have family in the same cemetery. Our family enjoys these blessings because we went where the Lord directed us to go. We acknowledge his hand in all things. When we follow him, we are blessed. When I recounted my blessings, I felt of his love for me and for each of you. At the beginning of devotional, I had uh, t-shirts handed out to the first 150 BYU Hawaii students to come in the doors. Those of you students who took those t-shirts, please put them on and stand. A word about the theme, I will go. It doesn't say where. It doesn't say how. You're going to have to figure that out on your own. But I think you've been taught well and you know how to get that direction. All right, so you probably thought, yes, a free T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, you thought wrong you will now have an opportunity to earn it. At the Polynesian Cultural Center, we dance. No. Just, just kidding. You, you are representing the student body as I review with you what we've learned and issue us a challenge. First, education is a never-ending process. We educate ourselves line upon line upon line upon line. Don't be afraid of failure. Three, 
God made us free and gave us commandments to keep us free. You have a lot of decisions to make. It's a beautiful time in your lives. But those decisions are crucial. They're critical. And I ask that you rely on the Lord as you make those decisions. Four, when in doubt, stay on the covenant path. Do we as your parents know everything? Absolutely not. Do we know on who to rely? Absolutely yes. And the challenge, number five, and the challenge to us all, go where the Lord tells you to go. My testimony I leave with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.